Father, we just thank you for your awesome love, Lord. I, I just appreciate you so much, Jesus. Thank you for who you are and what you've done, Lord. I continue to pray for my brothers and sisters here in this house and those that are watching, Lord, that your spirit, Father God, just flows in their life, in and out of their life, Lord, wherever they go, that they never forget about you, Lord, because you're the one that brought us home and you're the one that take us home, Jesus. So I thank you for today, Lord. Bless this message. Bless the people that are hearing it this morning, your people, Father God, that are hearing it this morning. And just help me to be a, a good speaker this morning, Father God. I'm self-conscious sometimes, but Lord, my confidence is not in me, it's in you. So I thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, you know, um, this message is called Godly Design. You know, and how many of you know that submission must always be to the Lord before anyone else? You must submit to Jesus Christ before anybody else, right? So last, two weeks ago, before we had our... Um, our um, worship day last Sunday, I asked my wife to finish off Colossians uh, 18 to 25 to submit to her husband, but she did not. As you can tell, I'm doing that this morning, so it was a little tough, and she did not do it, but it's okay. It's a little tough message, but I just thought I'd bring that up, but she's still submissive. We're supposed to be submissive to each other, right, as husband and wife, right? What I'm going to cover this morning, it's, it's a lot of context. You know, there's a lot of theological stuff in this, in this stuff from the Old to the New Testament. But I'm going to cover a lot of stuff. So you guys ready? All right. Do you guys know earlier in Colossians, the Apostle uh, Paul tells the believers in Colossae, in Colossians 3, 1, 2, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of what? Heaven. Not the things on earth. He goes to on to tell the Christians to put all things, all things of the old nature and to put on a clean, fresh garment of the new things. That's what we're supposed to do, right? When we come to Jesus, that's what happens to us, right? Our clothing, our attire is filthy rags, crimson, red as crimson. But when we come to Jesus, he makes us white as snow. He gives us a new garment. We're completely changed. And this is what the Bible does for us. When we follow Jesus, you know, we don't become perfect. You know, we're striving for, perf for, per for perfection. But you know what? Jesus is the only perfect one. So he goes to tell the Christians to put off all things. Have we really put off all things of the old nature? Do we still struggle with things of the old? I can raise my hand because I still struggle, right? We're human. We're going to struggle with things of the old, of the olden days. But you know what? The olden day doesn't make it better. It's the new creation in Jesus Christ that I'm after, that I'm after, that I'm after. So this takes us up through verse 17 where the Apostle Paul says, he makes an interesting statement of how we are to live if we want to be consistent with a new life that says this in Colossians 3.17. He says, whatever you do or say, do it as a what representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to the God, the Father. How many of you, some people are turned off by church Christians because the representation that we do for Jesus Christ, that we don't practice what we preach, that we're here at church praising God, worshiping, having tearful moments in worship, and here's Tom Garcia being a jerk out there. I'm so loving here at church. But I'm such a jerk out there on the roads, as my wife put it. She called me out on it, right? Anybody else been jerkish on the roads? <laughs> Don't raise your hands because I know we all have. Yes. But we have to be better representatives of what God has given us, guys. We have eternal salvation in Jesus Christ. Do you really practice what you preach? Are you really submissive to Jesus Christ? Have you had a realization that you are a new creation in Jesus? Sometimes our minds don't allow us to catch that. That's why we stay behind sometimes. We stay a step behind. You know, one of the things that I have on my, my iPad here, I have, and it always reminds me, you know, I put this on here. I'm going to turn this off real quick because I just want to show you. Hebrews 12, 1, the race continues. The race continues for us. The race is not over. Until we see Jesus face to face, we're still in a race. We're still in a race, and you know what? You're going to be challenged in your race. Wherever you go, you're going to be challenged. You're going to be challenged. You can go this way or that way. There's life. There's death. There's hope. There's no hope. There's, there's love. There's unloving. I mean, what are we trying to do this morning? What are we going to try to do as a rep representative of Jesus? 
And maybe Tom should have picked a different word than representative because representative, I can't talk today. <laughs> representative. All right. I told you I wasn't perfect, right? All right. A rep. How about a rep? I'm just going to say rep from now on. All right. And whatever you do or say, do as a rep of the Lord Jesus. That was much easier. Giving thanks through him to God the Father. But then we switch over now. 1841. 18, I'm sorry. 318 through Colossians 4.1. Paul gets specific as to what our new daily design should look like as opposed to the world's, right? Opposed to the world's way of doing things. If I'm a new creation in Jesus, I'm not supposed to be doing what the world's doing, right? I'm supposed to be a changed creation. I'm supposed to be a changed man. I've been a changed man. I'm a nice guy, I think. But, you know, if you would have known me before, I was a pretty nice guy going to where? Hell. Because I had it all messed up. I had it all mixed up. Had the cash, had the car. I didn't have the women, but, you know. I got the woman now. But that's what it was. You know, I thought things were different. I had my boundaries were different. Jesus or God, I knew about God. But all I knew about God was going to a Catholic church, doing my Hail Marys, Our Fathers. But then there's something happened that Jesus came along and he freed me from that. Then I don't have to go confess to someone else. I can confess to him one on one. That's what makes me an heir to the throne because I could talk to Jesus one on one. So here's the challenge for you. Do you talk to Jesus enough? When you're going through things, are you talking to yourself? Always Tom, you'll never amount to anything. You'll never find a wife. You'll never have a job. You'll never have a good car again. You're never going to find this. You're never going to find that. And you know what? You start believing what you say. You start believing what you speak into your life. What about I am a new creation? I'm no longer a slave to fear, to sin, to hopelessness, to this, to that, to my addictions. I'm a new man in Jesus. I'm a new man and woman in Jesus Christ. We have to change our language if we want to be submissive totally to Jesus Christ. Yes. So 1844 one, we're going to look at three different aspects of a person's life and he'll show us how being a Christian should affect them. Do you like this big water bottle that my wife made me? <laughs> I've been drinking two of these every day. That's a lot of water. It's much more awkward to drink that. <laughs> so he looks at three different aspects here. Firstly, he's going to deal with the husband and wife relationship. Secondly, he's going to deal with the parent and child relationship. All the children in the house, you ready? Yep. Finally, he's going to deal with the slave and master, which equals our employer and employee relationships today. Slave and master. Yeah. Of course, I don't call my employees slaves. Do you imagine how that would fare at my job? <laughs> hey, little slave, go do the work over there. I don't think that would fare well, right? So we're not going to do that. I don't even do that to my wife, right? All the husbands just stayed quiet. Do you do that to your wives? Oh, yeah, you better not. Yeah, I see you guys' eyes going down. All right, husbands and wife, 18 19. Tori, 18 and 19, really quick. Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting for those who belong to the Lord. Who likes that? I know. <laughs> husbands. Tori, I was going slowly, Tori. Tori. Next, go to, go to the first one. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. How do you feel when you hear that, women? How do you feel when you hear that? It's hard, huh? It's hard. It's hard to submit. But I'm going I'm to show you. I'm going to show you something what the Word of God says about submitting here. Th there, there's, there's a reasoning to my, my brain when I'm standing up here, when I'm thinking. Tori's trying to push me somewhere else, but I need to make a point. There is a point that's going to happen. It says the first area of the relationship is between husbands and wives, where wives are to be submissive to their husbands, and the husband must what? Now, Tori, you can go. If you're going to give us feedback on the new website and you have any feedback for our, our tech person, please. Her name is Tori, T-O-R-I, or Victoria Garcia. 
All right? Send her a message and let her know not to rush the pastor at this moment. Okay? So, husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Love your wives and never treat them harshly. That's tough too, right? Love your wives and never treat them harshly. So wives are to be submissive to their husbands, and the husbands must love their wives. You never treat them harshly? Oh, and never treat them harshly. And never treat them harshly. Is that 100% accurate all the time? Never, right? It says never, but I never do. It says husbands and their husbands must love their wives. However, before we get started, it's important to confront the issue that many seem to have with the Bible here. Especially Paul when he sees women. They look here at the idea of submission or being in subjection, subjection in the scripture and see it as a way of controlling women, right? A lot of people that don't know the scripture, they, they'll read this, submit, submit as a controlling thing, right? You ever hear people that don't know the word of God and don't read it entirely in context? You know, lady, I'm your husband. The Bible says you must submit to me because I am the man. Is that true? Is that how we should be acting? Is that how should we, we should be acting? It's not. Treat her harshly? That is, right? And never treat her harshly. That's what the Bible said, right? The Bible said if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ and we're going to follow his godly design, we have to actually do and practice what Jesus is telling us to do. It's pretty simple, right? Can we just go to the beginning of that scripture again, Tori? I'm going to stick on this because I think we get it messed up sometimes. 18 and, 18 and then 19. <laughs> Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. Oh, I started this this morning. I said submission must always be to the Lord before anyone, right? Who should the husband be submitted to before the wife submits to him? Christ, Jesus Christ. Yes. Men, are you truly submitted to Jesus Christ? Is your wife submitted to you? Honestly, is she submitted to you? Think about that today. I'm going to challenge you this morning because this is all a challenge for all of us. We have to submit to someone. And once again, submission is not control. Submission is not control or lording over someone. But the interesting thing here is before the gospel came along, women were seen more, women were seen just like, you're not going to get offended women, right? You're not going to throw apples or oranges or anything like that. You ate the apple anyway, so you're not going to throw the apple, right? So you're not going to throw that anyways. But back in the day, women were known more than just, they were known to be just like property. I'm being honest this morning, right? This is how it was, right? It's not today. With very few, if any, rights of their own, in all the cultural times at this time here. Some of the restrictions included unmarried women, women were not allowed to leave the home of their father without permission. Alyssa, we wouldn't have a basis if we had to follow this. Right? You imagine that? They, wouldn't, they weren't allowed to leave the home of their father without permission. Married women were not allowed to leave the home of their husband without their permission. Hmm. What do you think about that? They were restricted to roles of little to no authority. They could not testify in court. They could not appear in public venues. They were not allowed to talk to strangers. This is why Stephanie didn't want to do this. They had no double veil. They had to be double veiled when they left their homes. Do you imagine all the limitations they had to have during that time? That's a lot of limitations, right? Can't go shopping. Can't go to a store without your face un uncovered. You can't leave without my permission. However, on the other hand, Jesus' view of women was totally against that culture. 
He is the God that removed the what? The veil. He removed everything that keeps us separate or separated. For Christ, women were seen to have value. Do you value your woman today, men? Do you value what God has blessed you with? Or is she just none of, another one of the dudes? She's got to be different if she's your wife, right? In Matthew 19, 4, it says, Haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus replied, they rec record that from the beginning God made them male and female. He added to the fact that men and women are both created in the image of who? Of God. Which we also see in Genesis 127. God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. He did this by saying that God created man as male and female. Here we can say that Jesus respects women. He respects females. He didn't make male, male, female, female. He made men and women, right? That's what he made. In all his encounters that Jesus had with women, he respected them. He had many women disciples. He addressed them in public as well. Jesus stood outside of a box. When all these other men were doing this, as I described earlier to women, Jesus stood outside of the box. Do you stand outside of the box this morning and treat your women better than that? Would you have a woman if you didn't, if you continue treating her in this way? I don't think you would. He had many women disciples. He addressed them in public, which was completely unrelated to that culture. But that was Jesus. That's how Jesus was. Jesus had a different design for women. He didn't want them to be enslaved. He didn't want them to be handcuffed. He didn't want them to be enchained. He had various encounters with women in the gospel. And we can see that he treated them differently. And we should treat our women different. Sometimes as men, we get a little lax. You know, that we forget that our wives are sensitive. They're more sensitive than us. You know, we need to be more thoughtful as men. And this is not a counseling session. This is the, the Bible, right? This is the truth. You know, so if it's a counseling session to you, take it. It's counseling for you. Because we all can use a little counseling. And his name is Jesus. We can witness the Lord's compassion and incidents. A few women that I'm going to just bring up, just briefly. The woman at the well in John 4. You don't have to put those scriptures up for you. What do you do to the woman at the well? You sat with her, right? And in that days, that was unheard of because of that culture. The way men and that culture had. I mean, Jesus honestly shouldn't have sat with her. But he did. How about the woman caught in adultery? John 8. She would have been stoned, right? She should have been stoned, right? I always thought about that. What about the guys that were caught in adultery with her? You see how backwards it was? You see how messed up it was? That they only wanted to stone the woman, but what about the guys that were caught in adultery with her? We think about those things, right? I thought about that. I go, what happened to that guy? Does it even say in the Bible what happened to him? It doesn't even mention him, him, mention him, right? It only mentions the woman caught in adultery. And how about the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears in Luke 7? They all showed us how much he loved and respected women as people. God took the time even to sit with the filthiest man and the filthiest woman, and that's what Jesus is. That's how Jesus is different than any other person, any other thing that I ever known in my life. That in my, my failures, in, in my insecurities, in my hopelessness, that I went to Jesus and I said, Jesus, I can't do this on my own. And he sat with me and he comforted me and he changed me. He goes, you know why, Tom? You know why you, you're trying to do this on your own? Because you're trying to do it the Tom design, the Tom design way. But there's a godly way that God has all this done. God wants to come and transform our thinking. It starts thinking, thinking. When we get this right, we get this right. When we think about things, right? If you go around saying that everybody hates me, everybody hates you, right? In your own mind. That everybody's looking at me. <laughs> right now, everybody's looking at me. Stop it. But Paul continued this understanding. His writings 
in Galatians 3.28, he says this. This is the difference of Jesus. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There's so much controversy even today about women, right? Women can't do this. Women can't do that. Women are allowed to do that. Maybe someone's saying, I don't like that church because you have a basis that's a woman. You have someone that does this as a woman. You have someone that does this as a woman. But you know what? I don't care. What does the Bible say? There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ. Period. Who am I to hold someone back? If you have a gift and God wants to use that, regardless if you're a male or female, that's what God wants you to do. I am not here to be a barrier for anyone. We are here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and help you find your gift and what God can use you for. That's what Abide One is about. That's part of our mentoring and mission statements that we have here at this church. Period. And that's what it's about. So women today can enjoy greater freedom and opportunities than any other in the history of the world. But they are still handcuffed because they are females. And some of our females so much nowadays are so amazing at being females that some, can I say this? Can I say this? Are you ready for this? Culture shock? Females are so beautiful in what they want to do. They're so amazing at what they want to do that men cannot be men enough to be a man that they want to be like our female counterparts. Straight up truth, right? It trips me out. I know we're not supposed to be political, but see who won Women of the Year? <laughs> Man. That's sad to me. Times have changed. So listen, submission does not mean inferiority in any way. Just as Jesus himself was being submissive to God the Father, he does not imply or forces inferiority to anyone. He is equal to the Father. And according to Paul in Colossians 2.9, Christ lives in all the fullness of God in human body. Christ lives in all the fullness of body. So simply put, submission is something now out of love for God and others. Listen, men, you want, you want your woman to hear you a little better? You want your woman to follow you wherever you go? Are you submitted to Jesus Christ? If you're not submitted to Jesus Christ, maybe that's why you have such a hard time. Maybe that's why you're having a hard time making it through your life with your wife and your kids because you haven't submitted fully to Jesus Christ. You submitted to everything else but Jesus Christ. It's to willingly put yourself under someone or something and that's hard, right? That's hard because do people really 100% of the time submit themselves to Jesus Christ? There's questions sometimes. No one should be made forced to submit to anyone. I cannot force you to submit to Jesus. That's something that you have to do yourself. I cannot force you to submit to Jesus. That's something that you have to do on your own walk because at the end of this life, it's you and Jesus. Will you be known or will you be thrown? I like that. Put that as a quote. <laughs> Tom Garcia, will you be known or will you be thrown? Quote. Tori liked that. She's going to put it on the website. Thank you, Tori. It's going to be on the front page of our website. New website now. Just kidding. <laughs> In the case of the husband and wife, God has placed responsibility. Get this, guys. You guys ready for this? I'm talking to the men this morning. You guys got a big responsibility, huge responsibility. God has placed the responsibility of the spiritual and physical well-being of the family in the hands of the husband and father. He is ultimately responsible to God for making sure that all taken care, that all are taken care of and treated with the proper dignity and respect that a co-heir of Jesus Christ must show. It's tough, ain't it? Men, we have a lot of responsibility, but how many of you know that what a, what, a, what a fatherless home does in our society nowadays? 
Do you want to see the statistics? Humongous statistics. A fatherless home out there. Not that our moms don't do great because our moms are amazing, but there's some things that our boys and our daughters need from a father. They need that corrective action. So, sometimes moms give that, you know, but there's something when there's unity in the household and there's mom and dad in the household. There's something that happens. We can beat them together. They don't have to be, be separately. <laughs> Colossians 3, 18, 19. Oh, and I've read that already. We see Paul's teaching for in the book of Ephesians where he says that submission is something that all Christians do in one way or the other, right? We submit to some way, one way or the other. I submit to my wife completely, but the book of the, the, the Bible tells her to submit to me. But once again, if I'm not submitted to Jesus, she's going to have to follow me. Ephesians 5, 21, 25 says, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a household, for, for a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. He then goes on to tell the wives to be subject to their own husbands. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. However, once again, this is something, this is not something where a man is to force his wife to do anything. Does that make sense? Just because she submits to you doesn't mean she's your slave. That slavery was broken when she came to Jesus Christ. And it's not used in order to get your way in everything, men. It's not used to get your way in everything. Rather, you are to love his wife, your wife, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is a self-sacrificing love that is willing to die on behalf of his beloved. And we should honestly see that our wives are taken care for, care, cared, are cared for and cared about as well. Physically, emotionally, before all the other things, physically and emotionally. How many of you know that if she's physically taken care of, emotionally taken care of, the rest of the things are be much better for you, right? If you can help her out with everything, life's a piece of cake. And it says, and that she might grow to be spiritually mature and become all that she was made to be, all that she was made to be in Jesus Christ. See, she is no longer a slave, how I started this conversation earlier. She is free here. And here's another one in 525 um, Ephesians. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life. Once you, became, once you got married, you gave up your life, buddy. You said, you know what? I'm going to take care of you till death do us apart. I'm going to do this job, and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. I'm not going to selfishly think about myself any longer that I have you to think about, my wife. And we're going to talk about the kids a little later. But he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word, washed by the cleansing of God's word. The thing that happens nowadays is that more women – believe in Jesus more, and a lot of men are outside of the church, and it's continue, it's chronic all the time, right? More women come to church, if you think about it, more women come to church. There's probably more women in this, let me see, one, six, seven, more women in this church, yeah. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands, you ought to love your wives, love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. And you know what? That's what I see a lot. Men are so frustrated with their wives or hate their wives for something or another that they hate their wives. And the word says right here, you hate, the, you hate your wife then. You hate yourself, right? For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. 
As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illusion of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Who can agree with me that the world is completely selfish nowadays, though? And it looks out for themselves only, right? But however, the Christian must look out for the welfare of others. And husbands and wives, that's you. Those that are courting, that's you. You must look out for the welfare and the well-being of others. With the husband and the father, number one in the area of his own family. That's the issue. Fathers are not number ones in their fa- number one in their families anymore. That's why families are struggling still today. And it's been chronic for the last, what, 30, 40 years? 30 years maybe? 70s? I don't know. Getting old, I guess. And if the husband himself is subjection, and if the husband himself is is in subjection to the Lord, he won't do anything that scripture forbids or ask his wife and family to do either. Do you get that? Don't be telling your wife that she needs to do that or this against the word of God because you're her husband and she must submit to you. If it's not in accordance to the word of Jesus Christ, women don't do it. For those husbands who refuse to follow scripture, the wife is under no obligation to sin in order to please her husband. Submission must always be to the Lord before anyone. That moment I told Stephanie, Stephanie, oh, Jessica just doesn't do the, the announcements right. Can you take her out back and clonk her on the head with a, a block that I have back there? Nobody will know. Roll her down the hill. Nobody will know. Can you do that? Will you do that? Why? <laughs> she said, I'm crazy. You got to think about it. If I'm asking my wife to do something, I'm not going to do something contrary to the word of God. I will never say or do that anyways. That was just an example. But if it's not in accordance to Jesus' word, I'm not going to have Stephanie take Jessica out to the side and hit her, roll her off the cliff. That's not what God wants us to do. So submission must always be to the Lord. Men, you want a better marriage? Love your wife and never be harsh with her. Never be harsh with her. I mean, it takes both parties. I mean, women, you're pretty harsh sometimes too, right? Maybe it goes for you. Don't be harsh with your man. There you go. So now this leads Paul to another aspect of family and life and submission. That is kids and obedience to their parents. Whew. How many kids in this room? All of us are kids. But once again, before the gospel took hold in the ancient world, children were seen as little more than property, just like the women. If you had a baby, oh well. You didn't like that color? You didn't like that one? Pop it out. Back in the day, the adults regarded kids as trouble, animals that were treated like pets and were used and abused even to death without anyone pretty much caring. Parents, I know you want to kill your kids sometimes, but back in the day, they used to kill their kids a lot. The Romans back in the day had total power of life and death at this moment. They had slaves, and the kids were all theirs. And the Romans made this law. If you don't like the kid, if you had too many kids, kick them out. Kick them out. Parents would get anxious when they would have too many kids back in the day about taking care of their kids. Anybody get anxious about taking care of your kids sometimes? But these guys, what they did, they got so anxious, they started killing their kids. They started taking their kids out. Do you imagine the trauma that the remaining kids would have? Come here, little Tommy. We're going to go out to the cliff in the back with Uncle Tom. And we're going to hit you with a block and knock you out the side of the wall. Daddy, where's little Tommy? I don't know where little Tommy went. (laughs) it was a convenience thing 
you didn't have, if you had the kid and you didn't like the kid, you could take him out back and just take him out. You think it was just boys? Boys and girls. Little girls were abandoned. Rarely more than three kids were ever kept in a family back in the day. The rest were killed or sold into prostitution while still babies. Isn't our perverted still world like that? Isn't our world still perverted like that today? It's worse, yeah. But we're no different than Sodom and Gomorrah. We're no different than these ages and times here. They would take these little boys and girls and do horrific things with them for their own pleasures. And we still see that today. The killing of kids by wealthy Greek patients, or parents, I'm sorry, were so common because of their own selfish reasons. We raised four kids, and through those years, we wanted to not physically or literally kill our kids, but we never thought it this far. Maybe once. These people would buy kids from the poor because they needed cash or food. They offered them for sale like they're animals. As a matter of fact, they were slaughtered just like little lambs. And I read this and I was thinking, our world hasn't changed much in over the centuries. Kids are still slaughtered and they're still put to death in horrific ways today. But I tell you, in AD, 374 AD, hope came along by Emperor Valentine, he considered killing of babies to be punishable as murder. Can you believe that? That someone finally said, I am sick and tired of my culture taking babies and killing them for no apparent reason or for, my, for the selfishness of others. And this Emperor Valentine came around and said, I turn it around. You do that again, you're going to die. We're going to put you to death. And I, he probably didn't even know Jesus, but he was just sick and tired of the, how do you say this word? Infanticide. In, how do you say it? No. Infant side. Infant. Inf no, not fences. Infant. I want to say this word right. I was going to ask Josh because he, I think he knows the word um, right here. Infanticide. No, it's not infanticide. Infanticide. The killing of babies. Let's stop using big words. The killing of babies. Just like representative, I'm going to use rep, infanticide, killing the babies. All right. All right. The killing of babies to be punishable as murder by Emperor Valentine. And, and I thought that was kind of cool that someone stood up for the babies. Someone stood up for the babies. And this happened a long time ago. So we need to stand up for babies today too, right? So let's do that. But once again, we can see how Jesus' treatment of kids was countercultural. It was he who said in Matthew 19, 14, 2, he said, But Jesus said, Let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. We can go back to the book of Genesis and see that all mankind was created in the image of God, right? And the Bible is general, including the Old Testament, saw kids as a heritage and reward from the Lord as seen in Psalms 127. Children are a what? Gift from the Lord. And you know what? The thing that trips me out is that this scripture was there with those guys that were killing all these babies, right? They didn't read their Bible. See, Bible knowledge, you got to get to know your Bible. But be a Bible man or a Bible lady, Bible girl. Get into the Word and start looking at the Word of God. Children are to be a gift from God or the Lord. They are a reward for Him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. But joy, how joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accuser at the city gate. And if we take these things to a logical conclusion, Jesus and Paul ultimately did get the Christ-centered view of children that has led to our society today. And we should be loving parents, protecting and nurturing kids. How easy is it nowadays just to throw your kids away? I know most of y'all got kids in here. 
we got a lot of dang kids. <laughs> We're missing one family that has another five kids here. But between like three or four families, we have like 28 kids. <laughs> what a blessing, right? What a blessing. But my kids are grown up, so it's okay. Further, it shows the dangers in our society and others of getting away from the values that have guided us over the centuries. When I, when I was reading about this guy, Valentin, it, it kind of gave my heart a little hope that I wish someone would stand up today and say, you know what, anybody that does X, Y, and Z to these little ones, use the words of old, punishable by murder, right? Those are harsh words. But are we not to protect our kids? Are we not supposed to nurture our kids, keep them safe, and not worry about people taking advantage of our kids? Yeah. And getting back to Colossians 3, we see how the Apostle Paul first addressed kids and then fathers here. Since it is the father's responsibility as the head of the house to see that kids are properly raised, he is the one addressed here rather than the wife. All the women are completely important. But when you talk about responsibility, yours. When you have kids, yours. You have kids, yours and yours and mine. We're responsible men. That's why the word says here, right? For most of our women, they raise our kids alone. Even when they're married. Even when we're married, they're married. Children are to obey their parents in all things because this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Once again, we get further insight from the parallel message in Ephesians 6, which says, Tori, are you up there? Um, Ephesians 6, 1, 4. She's a little slow today, but it's okay. This is for you kids. It says, children, obey your parents because you belong to who? Do you belong to your parents? Sort of, but you firstly belong to the Lord, right? This is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a what? Promise. Promise. If you honor your father and mother, 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 <laughs> mother, things will what? And you will what? Fathers, do not provoke your kids to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the, with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. That's kind of hard for me. You know, I'm older now. My kids are raised. But man, did I provoke my kids. I was a provoker. I still am. Yes, I am. But to my kids, oh my gosh. I don't believe, I can't believe my kids survived my provoking spirit growing up. But they deserved it. They deserved it. That's my take. The Bible says in Genesis 2.24, they are to leave. A kid is supposed to leave father and mom once the man is joined to his wife, thus making a new household. I did provoke my kids a lot, but I was just playing. I scared them. I made them cry a lot. They would cry. I would open my back door, throw them outside until they stopped crying. Do you remember those days? Jerry, you remember those days? The provoking spirit. Remember the back shed? I used to get you in there, throw you in there, put the lock on there, or leave you in there. When mom wasn't home, of course, I wouldn't do that when she was there. But I provoked you while there was no light, and I did it at dark, but it's okay. Yeah, but the idea of honoring father and mom never ends. Regardless of what happens, you know what? It's, it's hard to forgive and forget, but the Bible says they deserve honor, right? And I know my kids forgive me for that because they still come and visit. They still come and visit me, so I, I think we did something right. And now they're provoking. I think we did something right, you know. Um, and um, now they do it to their wives. Uh, my son this morning, I, I kind of had to chuckle. I was, I was like, you shouldn't treat your wife that way, son. But Lamanda, I'm so sorry I had to chuckle a little bit. He said he got this pan with a wooden spoon. And he said he was trying to wake up his wife, marching around the house. And in Tom's mind, Tom used to do that myself. Yes, I used to do that myself. And um, 
I said, you know, I never really did that a lot. I used to say, don't let the wave catch you. This was cold water from a refrigerator. And he said, thanks, Dad, for the idea. I forgot about that. I'm going to use it next time. So, so my provoking spirit has gone over to my sons. Yeah. <laughs> No, but sincerely, um, our, our kids, we deserve honor. I mean, our parents deserve honor, you know what I mean? As the vessels that the Lord used to bring you up to the point where you can take responsibility for yourself. And for once in our lives, you know, after 24, 25 years, my wife, we love our kids, but man, we are enjoying our lives. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to come one day, sister. We are enjoying our lives. And you know what? It, it's kind of cool. We haven't changed the locks yet, but we're eventually going to do that. <laughs> yeah. And in, the provo- <laughs> and in the provoking Colossians 3.21, fathers do not aggravate your kids and um, they will become discouraged. In my defense, I didn't read this scripture when the kids were growing up. So, <laughs> so I had no clue with that. <laughs> I read that today sometimes, so I... So that's why I ask God for forgiveness. Uh, but um, this is translated as well, provoke. Um, the word means not to stir up or irritate. And man, you know what? I did it to my sisters. I did it to my kids. And I still do it to my wife. I provoke and irritate her today still. We're by ourselves. So I'm sorry, Steph, but it's you now. And <laughs> Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your kids or children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Listen, the father's whole goal with his child is to raise them so that they are older, right? We need to raise our kids, rear our kids, and show them the right way. You know what? We did the best that we can do, right? Parents, if you feel like you're struggling sometimes, you know what? Take a step back and say, I'm doing the best that I can do with what I got right now. They will love and serve the Lord with their lives and bring up their own kids to do the same. My ultimate desire, our ultimate desire, is to see our kids completely in church. I'm still trying to talk Jeremiah to come and play this cajon for us. He's got some beat. But you know what? I'm calling it. He keeps fighting it, but he deserves to be in ministry as well, too, you know? I mean, he wants change in his life for him, his family, his wife. He's got to do something for Jesus. He's going to step up the game for Jesus. It's just not about the temporal. It's not about the physical, right? If we don't put Jesus first, nothing works, right? I'm not just saying that he has to be on the worship team to, to get that, but overall, you just got to put Jesus first. All right. The parent, finally, finally in this one. Of course, the child ultimately has a mind of his, his or her own way. Our kids have their own mind, right? And may choose to do whatever the heck they want, right? I could say that 50% of my kids come to church. I'm waiting for the other 50%. And you know what? One day they're going to come. They're going to come. However, the parents should constantly be thinking of how they can teach their kids in the way of the Lord so that their own kids can make good choices in the future as well, too. Now let's turn to the end. I'm almost coming in for a landing. A lot of information, a lot of chit-chat, a lot of talking. But of course, uh, number three, we're going to talk about slave and master or employer and employee. Who likes their employer 100% of the time? Boo. Who said that? Oh, you don't have to raise your hand, but ah, uh, ah, uh, never mind. You like your employer 100% of the time? Then why do you talk so much when you get home after work about your employer? You talk about your employer every single day. I'm not saying who it is. I didn't say it was Jerry. All right. Slave and master. Yep. Employer and employee. So, so we can see that the gospel changed how mankind has viewed slavery, right? We went from all these enslaved items that we had, even from our women, from men, from kids, from everything to what we are today, right? We can't expect to be an employer or a master of everything, but really a master of none if we don't treat people respectfully. Most of the ancient world was full of men owning other men, women, kids, for various reasons, as we found that out as well, too. And they didn't always do this little work. They did humongous jobs. They did all kinds of things that these masters didn't want to do. You know how you become a great employee or a great employer? 
You know how you become a great employer? By doing the things your employees do. When you can understand and get into the shoes of your employer or employee, people will respect you more. The more you know about someone else's job, even though it's not your job, the better outcome you will have. If someone could come and say, you know what, I need help in this, can you help me? If you could say yes, or let me find the answers, or I don't have the answer right now, let me do that for you, people respect you a lot more than that. But if you just blow people off and say, you're on your own, buddy, I'm my own job, I'm the manager, I'm the manager, you're the employee, you do what you need to do, you figure out a way to do it. Which way will work best? If I stand beside my employee or our employee and work with them together to get the answer right, to get the, the favorable outcome, right? That's what we need to do. But back then, these slaves were, these slaves who were doctors and lawyers, for instance, and not all slaves were treated poorly by their masters. Some were treated well because they were valued property and could not be easily replaced. I have a whole bunch of employees that can't be replaced. Although I have a few that can be replaced. How's that sound? Vero, you're not one of those. <laughs> However, the Christian view of man being created in God's image revolutionized the world for us. And it was led, it has led to the end of slavery altogether in the parts of the world where the good news of Jesus Christ has taken root fully. There were tons of slaves in Paul's time, and he and the other apostles didn't approach the situation by telling people to release their slaves. In order to do that, they would have had to change complete society at that time. They would have to completely change everything in that. And their mission wasn't to do that. It was to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to all humanity at that moment. And that alone is what has changed societies today. And we have seen that in our own, own, own country. Paul tells those who were slaves in the Colossians church that their way of submission to the Lord was to obey their what? Their masters. Not just with external service to merely please men, but sincerely out of fear of the Lord. I mean, if you don't really know the, the, the word of God, it can get confusing, right? Because that what I just spoke about can really confuse people of what it says. Not just with external services or service to merely please men, but sincerely out of the fear of the Lord. If we did it out of the fear of the Lord, I mean, we would be better employees ourselves. I have a lot to learn as an employee. And I've been doing my job almost 20 years, but there's a lot more that I can learn. For God is ultimately our master, right? And it is the Lord that will one day reward us for our good deeds, right? For our true submission to our employers. Even though our employer sometimes just doesn't do things godly or just doesn't do things the way I want them, I still have to respect my employer. And the Bible says if they do wrong, it is the Lord who will be their judge too. We can judge our employer all we want or our employee all we want, but it is the Lord who will judge both, the, both, both parties. And in the same way, masters were to treat their slaves with justice and fairness. The reason for this was even the master's answer to a higher authority, right? We all answer to a higher authority, regardless of who you are. Tom could think he's the manager of the clinic where I work, but Tom has to answer to someone else. And then that person has to answer to someone else as well. So if I don't do what I need to do, I'm going to get reprimanded by the people that tell me what to do, right? The Lord is the master, though. And this master was to, supposed to treat his slaves well in submission to the Lord. I'm submitted to my employer, but I'm submitted to Jesus Christ. Firstly, that's why I can submit to my employer. And you know what? They are going to be judged of what they do as leaders in the organization I work at. They will be judged what they do as leaders. I have to submit wholeheartedly to them with my submission to Jesus Christ first. But once again, we don't have the slave-master relationships today. Thank God for that. And most of us work for someone else, unless you're well off in this house. Anybody work for, some, anybody work for themselves?
Biblically speaking, it is the job of the employer to give an honest day's work, right? I know you bust your butt, Jesus. I, I know they give you the hard job, excuse me. I know they give you the big houses alone. They know you can do it. They know you're going to complain, but they don't change because they know you can do it. And you give an honest day's work, and that's what God has called you to do. Randy, you do something different. You do all kinds of things. I don't even know what you do, Randy. I'm just joking, Randy. Sometimes I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why it slows down our internet. The employer and the boss must do everything they can to treat other people respectfully. You ever work somewhere where they just can't stand the boss? I hope I'm not one of those guys. I never know. No, you know what? I work in a, a facility with more women, 90, or probably 95% women, and they're very vocal. Very vocal. So if someone didn't like me, I challenge anyone to come and tell me they don't like me. I can take it. I can take it. I'll try to fix what I'm doing, but I can take it. All right. Coming in for a landing, guys. There's a lot. Did she say it? What did she say? She said she loved me. As we finish up this section of Colossians, we're reminded that no longer, we no longer belong to the world in which we are passing through. We're headed to heaven, right? I'm headed to heaven because all this that's happening around me, I can tolerate because I am submitted to Jesus. And if I keep my eyes focused and, and continue to be submitted to Jesus, everything else is fine. I'm not going to say it's a piece of cake. You know, it, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to stay submitted to Jesus Christ. Well, that's not a challenge to stay submitted to Jesus Christ. It's, it's a challenge to stay submitted to other people sometimes because they're the ones that challenge you. They're the ones that frustrate you. <sighs> and I'll leave it there. His lordship affects every part of our lives, including the husband and wife, the parent and the child, and the relationship that we have with our employees or employee. James said in 2.18, Now if someone may argue, some people may have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Listen, a godly design only begins with total submission to Jesus, Jesus Christ. So that means all of us have been left on earth here for a specific reason. Today, God is using us to show this, this negative world his glory, his love, his faithfulness, his forgiveness, his love and kindness. And we do that by submitting to Jesus. True submission to something or someone else must first be submitted to Jesus Christ. That's how we can get through this world. And if we do that, guys, we can truly see at the end of our lives that I have been a reflection and I have been successful in Jesus Christ by following his godly design in my life. I don't want to be like anyone else but Jesus Christ. I don't think my wife wants another Tom. I don't think she can handle another Tom. Because everything that my kids went through, she has to go through now. Although she punishes me more than my kids could ever punish me. But try to live out your godly design, guys. You're here for an awesome purpose in this life. And you know what? Jesus has created you to be a, a, an overcomer, an overachiever in the Bible. Keep striving for him. Keep reading your book. Keep looking at scripture. Keep Keep worshiping and praising him, even through the hardest times of your life. The difference between a sold-out Christian and everybody else is that we have Jesus to fall back on. And that's the design I want in my life. I want him to come and transform us every single day of my life. And it just doesn't happen on Sunday morning. It happens every morning. Is Tommy here? No. No? Worship an iPad, okay. All right. Well, what do you got for us, Tori? Well, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's stand. Let's pray. And then we'll release y'all for the day. Just try to seek Jesus in everything that you do, guys.
We need stronger fathers. We need stronger mothers. We need stronger kids in the household. We need a revolution in our own. You know, like that movie came out, The Jesus Revolution. We need a Jesus revolution in our households. And you know, men, this is for you. If your kids are far away from Jesus this morning, or if they don't really know who he is, step up your game. Don't be lame. Put that on there too, Tori. Step up your game. Don't be lame. Yeah. Yeah, quotes. Quotes this morning. But I'm just saying, men, we need to rise up the bar. I am thankful at least 50% of my kids come to church. It's not the other kids didn't know what Jesus was or who Jesus was or what he did. It was their own choosing to fall away from Jesus. Because we all have a choice, right? We all have a choice. We all have a choice. Our job was to raise these kids and send them out on their own, praying that they'll be successful in Jesus. And you know, whatever happens, happens. So parents, if your kids have fallen away, it's not your fault. They're adults, right? They have their own minds to make up. Will I follow Jesus all the days of my life? Or will I follow what everybody else is doing all the days of my life? So I pray that God's design in your life comes to, here's another big word, fruition? Fruition. I pray that it just comes to fruition this morning. And I pray that men and women and kids alike in this place and those that are watching just raise their game. And they truly submit to Jesus in everything that they do and make things much easier in our lives. So, Father, as we close today, Lord, I thank you for, for you, Lord. I thank you for your love upon this house, Lord. Thank you, for, thank you for aligning us, Jesus, and what we need to do in this world, Lord. May the Holy Spirit just come and transform us and change our minds, Lord. Thank God that we are not living in those days where our wives and our kids and our, and our men do not matter, Lord. Thank you for breaking the chains of our slavery, Father. Thank you for freedom in you, Jesus. Thank you for a hope and a love that I can imitate out there to this lost world, Lord. May my godly design, Father God, just be infectious to those out, outside these walls, Lord. May we worship you in everything that we do, Father. And may we take this call serious this morning, Lord. We worship you and we thank you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.